So, presenting the next invited speaker, uh, Felipe, Dr. Felipe Leno da Silva. He is currently a postdoc on reinforcement learning researcher at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where he works on several projects related with reinforcement learning and national defense. Then uh, he, his works are uh, concerned with several topics of machine learning, and he is also better known for his research on transfer learning for multi-agent reinforcement learning. So please welcome uh, Dr. Felipe Leno da Silva. Hi, thanks. Uh, I want to start by uh, thanking for the invitation for this awesome workshop. And I will present some of, uh, most of, most of the work I will present here, I've developed uh, during my PhD. So thanks for the introduction, Miguel. So there is like a, a slide or a quick background, but uh, Miguel has already introduced me. So uh, I'm now working at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which is in, in the San Francisco Bay Area in the US. Uh, before I was a PhD student at the University of Sao Paulo. And part of my PhD I did at the UT Austin with Peter Stone. And during my PhD, I also did a research internship at Borealis AI with uh, Matt Taylor, who also presented today a little earlier. Uh, and between my PhD and the time when I came to the US, I also did a postdoc in Brazil at the Advanced Institute for AI. So starting now uh, in the technical presentation, I, I think like after the whole uh, day of workshop about reinforcement learning, uh, we, you already have seen this picture a lot of times, so I won't lose a, a, a lot of time in it. So basically we have an agent in the environment, the agent can observe the environment and based in the state of the environment, they, they apply one action. And this action causes a state transition, which, uh, and after that, the agent is able to observe the next state and the reward signal. And the reward signal is uh, the only feedback the agent has to solve the test. So it has to apply actions and uh, see what happens to the, to the environment. So this is the basic reinforcement learning setting. So for most of uh, my works and during the presentation here, I will present. We also are dealing with multi-agent reinforcement learning, which is uh, kind of similar to the regular reinforcement learning, but we will have multiple agents in the environment and all of them might be applying actions at the same time. So we have an, an environment where we have a number of agents uh, in this environment. All of those agents can observe uh, a state and each of them at every uh, decision step, they will choose one action to apply in the environment. And right now, instead of having just one action that uh, affects how the, the environment is updated, now all the, action, all the actions of all the agents will change the environment at the same time. And apart from that, it's pretty much the same thing as in the single agent case. All of the agents can observe the next state and the next reward signal that they use for uh, for updating their models. And this has to be repeated until termination condition. Usually, if you don't have any sort of other feedback, the agent will just apply actions randomly and see what happens and see what happens until the agent is able to optimize the solution of the task. So reinforcement learning has been successfully used in many hard tasks. Some examples are the some kind of very complicated games such as uh, StarCraft or even the game of Go that became very famous, the Alpha, Alpha Go even has a movie. Or as uh, we have seen even in, in the presentations before, we have autonomous driving and a lot of other applications where applications that could not be solved in a, in a recent past, but now can be uh, reinforcement learning can be used to solve those very challenging real world tests. The problem is that if we use the classical approach of reinforcement learning, 
it takes a lot of interactions uh, with the environment be before the agent is able to learn how to solve a task. So for example, this is from a, a recent paper, like uh, maybe two years old, a little less. So the agents take 1 million of episodes or 1 million of repetitions of the task for solving Palmer Man. And you might think, yeah, 1 million of repetitions, uh, it's a lot. So it's probably a very challenging task. But actually, Palmer Man, it's a simplification of the Bomber Man game. So this is way, way simpler than the real world challenges we have, uh, we want to use reinforcement learning for solving. And it still takes 1 million repetitions for solving this, uh, let's say, very simple task. So the main research goal of my uh, career, since the beginning of my PhD until now, is to accelerate the learning process to scale up reinforcement learning, in this case, multi-agent reinforcement learning. And there are a couple of ways we uh, can do this, but the approach I've always uh, followed is by accelerating learning through knowledge reuse. So if you have the knowledge already available in, in the system, why not reuse it? And this knowledge can come from uh, your previous knowledge of the task or another agent in the system might be an automated e agent also using reinforcement learning or a human or uh, any kind of uh, other knowledge source. So the uh, paradigm I will talk about during this task is one called uh, action advising where one agent usually provides action suggestions to another. So you might imagine something like you have one agent trying to learn and you have another one that uh, at least for the moment takes the the teacher role and can provide some action suggestions that will help the the learning agent with uh, its exploration so uh, for our first work in this direction we started to think about on how to do this so how one agent could could provide uh, suggestions to other agents. And the key issue here is uh, estimating how good the current policy is. Because uh, you, do not you do not want like one agent providing action suggestions all the time to other agents because you're gonna expand a lot of communication and a lot of uh, bandwidth and it would become infeasible for many of the real world applications. So you want to communicate those uh, those actual suggestions only when you need it, when you need it and the only way you can uh, figure out when to give those suggestions is by estimating how good the, the agent policy is so you can identify the best opportunities to ask for or to give advice and this is the main challenge of this type of uh, transfer learning so uh, our uh, the related work more, uh, let's say, more relevant to our approach was at the time, the Torrey and Taylor uh, paper that was presented in, in AMAS at 2013. So the main, the main question that was answered by this paper was when one agent can give advice to another. And they proposed the importance advising metric that is uh, shown here. So the basic idea, the basic idea here is uh, you probably have seen the Q function in other presentations during this workshop, but it it basically means if you have not seen it, it means what is the quality for a given action in a given state. So we are in a given state. So how should I define if the agent should receive action suggestions now or not? Uh, so this is the importance advising metric and what it means it is if if you have a lot of possible actions that you can apply in this in this state you should only give the the action suggestion to the agent if the difference between the best action and the worst action is is very high and what this means is if the agent is in a state where it doesn't matter which action uh, is applied that is you will have the same result then you don't need to waste communication. But if the agent is in a situation where applying the wrong action 
might have terrible consequences, then you should give this suggestion to improve the exploration. And this uh, is the main takeaway of the, their paper, which is uh, awesome because it kind of like has uh, the same uh, general motivation that we have, but it has some weaknesses. So for example, the demonstrator or the agent giving suggestions needs uh, need to have a, a Q function. And for example, a human does not have a Q function. So it's a little, a little bit hard to, to apply either some suggestions given by a human or by an agent that is learning as well. Because if the agent is learning, the agent has an estimate for the Q function, but it's not the, three, the true Q function. So you cannot be certain that this important advising will have the, the right value right now, okay? And also the advice is not given considering the learning agent knowledge. So you are considering the teacher knowledge to decide when uh, to give suggestions, but it has nothing to do with the learning, so the learning agent. So you might be giving suggestions on states where the agent already know already knows what to do. And then we propose the ad hoc advising that kind of like deals with some of those weaknesses. So we adapt this teacher student framework in a way it's still flexible and more flexible than the, the original one. So the, the framework can reuse expertise from humans or trained agents or agents using other kind of learning algorithms. And the advisors or the agents who, who will uh, be giving action suggestions, they do not need to be experts right now. And also the advisees or the agents who will receive the suggestions, they do not need to be constantly observed. And so this is like a, a high level explanation of how it works. We have one agent learning the environment. And before taking any action, the agent queries a, a confidence function for defining if it knows what to do or not, or if it is confident on its action, its, uh, its policy in this state or not. And let's say the agent is not confident. So the agent will broadcast a request for help. So for example, here this robot is saying, yeah, I don't know what to do in this state. I have never seen it before. So can any of you help me? And the other agents in the system that might be learning as well, and you might also think that uh, some of those advisors might be humans. And they also have a, a confidence function. And they will either say, yeah, I also don't know what to do. What is this advisor one doing? And not provide any kind of suggestion. Or if they are confident, they might say, yeah, so you should do action A or action B in this state, in this one, it's telling the advisee to go to the left, for example. And OK, this is a good idea. But one missing uh, piece is the confidence function. So how can we calculate the confidence of the agent uh, in applying actions for a given state? So for our initial uh, for our initial work, we considered uh, the number of visits of the agent in a given state as a proxy of its confidence. So if the agent has uh, has never seen a state before, we assume that the agent has a very little knowledge about what to do in this situation. If the agent has seen this state a lot of times, it means that the agent has already explored a little bit this state, so it should have a better knowledge. So this is what this, uh, this confidence function reflects. So the probability of asking for help is higher when the agent has never seen the state before or has seen the state very few times. And the, the probability for giving help is the opposite. So if the agent has seen the, they state a lot of times, then the agent will feel confident in providing suggestions to the other agents. And we actually propose two variations of this uh, metric. The second one, we also take into account the Q values if the agent has access to it. And it's a little bit more similar to the teacher uh, student framework, but we also consider the number of visits. So we, we have the same motivation that if the best 
and the worst actions are very different in a given state, we should give this, the action suggestion. But we also take into account if the agent has seen this state a lot of times, so we can be confident on, on how much the agent knows about the, the Q function in this specific state. Uh, so uh, at first we assume that the advice is always trust in the received advice. This might not hold for all real world applications, uh, but at least for the beginning, we assume that they, they always apply the, the given advice. And there is a limitation in the number of received or given advice. And for evaluation, we use the how field offense domain, which is very easy to understand what the agent is trying to do. This is a simulation of uh, robot soccer, and you are controlling the agent star trying to score a goal. And it's a pretty it's a pretty hard task task to solve. Not very popular anymore, but a very good environment to uh, to evaluate learning algorithms, especially multi agent learning algorithms. And for comparison purposes, we compare the original teacher student framework. Uh, we compare another variation of the algorithm where the agents do not provide action suggestions, but they share the successful episodes among them and not using, uh, not using any kind of transfer learning method. Uh, and those are some of the results we have gathered. Like in the, the paper, we have a more uh, deep exploration of the, the results. But the, the main takeaway of the results is that ad hoc advising performed better than the other uh, advising algorithms while you using less advice or, or advising fewer pieces of communication. Uh, and this is a very positive result because we have a better use of communication and you can uh, achieve a little bit better performance in a very challenging domain. So uh, the main conclusion of this first paper was that ad hoc advising improved learning uh, in systems composed of simultaneously learning agents. And you can also like substitute some of those learning agents to humans or to legacy systems or something like this. And the, the framework is very flexible. But the main weakness in this first paper was that this confidence function uh, computation needs a uh, state count, so how many times the agent has seen this state before. And it's very hard to estimate if you do not have the st state counts available. For example, if your state is defined by an image or something like this, it's still possible, but it's very hard. So the next work, uh, in the next work, we explored how we can extend the ad hoc advising framework uh, in a way that it would not require the state counts anymore. And the agents can receive the advice based on their epistemic uncertainty. Uh, so if you don't know what is the epistemic uncertainty, basically it's the uncertainty stemmed from the lack, lack of knowledge. So it's not the uncertainty because the environment is stochastic. It's the uncertainty because the agent doesn't know what to do. So that's pretty much what we always uh, have been looking for. And this is the main objective of this paper. And what we do, what uh, we what we do here is that we assume that the agent will be using uh, deep reinforcement learning, which is a more uh, modern takeaway of uh, reinforcement learning. So the agents use a neural network to learn that Q table or that uh, Q values that define what is the quality for the for the, the actions in each of the states. And this is the cost function that is used by DQ and so on of deep uh, reinforcement learning methods, the one of the most famous ones. So assuming that we have a neural network like this defining uh, the Q values, so how can we uh, estimate the, the epistemic uncertainty given that we have an agent trying to solve a task using a neural network like this one. So what the, the neural network will look like normally by using like regular deep reinforcement learning 
we have the inputs that are the state features. And then they go through like hidden layers that might be CNNs or fully connected layers. It depends on the test we're trying to solve. And in the end, we will have a Q value for each of the actions. So we have like action one and the prediction of the, the, the value or the quality of the, this action, action two, action three, action four, and so forth. And what we do is we change this architecture a little bit to have multiple predictions for the same Q value. So instead of having like the inputs, the hidden layer, and one prediction of quality value for uh, the each of the actions, we, act, we actually have multiple predictions for the same action. So right now we will have this, this structure we call as heads. So we have multiple heads for each of the actions. And those heads, they are kind of like, predicting the same thing. So the quality for action one in state X. And what, so what do we do uh, that? So you must remember that we, what we are trying to do is to estimate what is the uh, uncertainty of the agent for a given, for a given state in a given action. And by having those structures, the heads, we can use uh, the variance between them as a proxy of the agent uncertainty. So uh, in the beginning of the learning process, the agent will initialize the network with random values. So even though all of those heads, they are predicting the same thing, they, they, uh, the variance between them will be very high because they are pretty much outputting random values. After the agent keep, keeps updating uh, its predictions by exploring the environment, those metrics will get closer and closer and closer. Ideally, they will get to the same value. They won't probably, but they will get very close. And then you will see over time that the variance between those predictions will be reducing as much as the uncertainty of the agent. So you might use this as a proxy of the uncertainty. So the uncertainty for this new approach that we call as RCMP is the variance between the predictions for the, the heads of that same action and the same state. So we take the average of the, the variance here, but you can easily think on a lot of variations. So for example, you can uh, take the maximum value and saying that you you, you want to uh, minimize the, the, the variance as much as possible and not minimize the, the maximum variance, but not the average and so forth. But you can easily like just get the average from uh, those variances, use this as a proxy of the uncertainty and your final Q value or your final prediction for the quality of uh, a given action in a given state is just the average of all those heads. So we compared our CMIC MP against some other uh, some other advising frameworks. So not using advice, using random advice, or using importance advising, which is the original teacher student framework again. And here we use the the Pong. Uh, environment, very famous one, Atari, using a trained demonstrator. So the, the trained demonstrator doesn't have the optimal policy, but has a competent, competent one. And the results that we observe in the paper, so if you're interested, you can read the paper to see more detail all the, uh, all the evaluations. But we again have better performance while having better use of advice. And one thing that is different from the first uh, iteration, let's say this way of the ad hoc advising is that RCMP is able to stop advising uh, once the agent identifies that it doesn't need the advice anymore. So after the, the confidence gets low, the agent just stops, uh, uh, stop asking for advising. And this did not happen uh, in the, previous version, so the agent will keep asking for advice until the, the budget 
the budget finishes and this one is able to stop and say no i don't need anymore so human you can go home and do other things you, you you do not have to keep helping me to solve this task so the main conclusions is, are that RCMP performed better than the baselines and receiving advice was uh, advantageous in, in our uh, evaluations and RCMP combined ad hoc advising uh, and provide provides the ability of like transferring knowledge from one agent to another and those agents can be humans, for example, or they can be other automated agents using RL or genetic algorithms or anything else. So, uh, so that's pretty much all the presentation about the method itself. But there are a lot of other methods using the same high level idea. So if you are interested in reading more about this or reading more about other ways in which you can leverage human feedback for uh, training faster a, a reinforcement learning agent. I have written some like surveys in different uh, uh, levels of abstraction and you can take a look at any of them. So in a very high level, I have like an eight page mini survey that was published at EGKI. The uh, journal survey that was uh, published at the Journal of Artificial artificial intelligence research has deeper discussions and more methods being discussed and if you are not very confident on your reinforcement learning skills because you come from other field you have you might take a look at my book to have a more didactic explanation of those algorithms and how they can be used so thank you very much for the invitation again and if we still have some time I can take some questions about uh, the method or about anything else. Thank you. Great. Thanks to you for the participation and your interesting presentation. There, there is a, a question on the chat, uh, which Thomen asks about in RCMP, instead of using multiple heads, is it equivalent to use ensemble methods to compute the variance in the function? Uh, yes, so so the main the main motivation of using the multiple heads is the same high level motivations of any kind of like ensemble method. So you have multiple predictions, and then you look at uh, each of the individual predictions and and take some decisions regarding like the combination of all those results. So you might also in this case, we use the multiple heads because they are easy to implement. So it requires very little changes in the code if you have like a DQN agent and wants to modify it. But you could also think in other ways of building ensembles uh, to get this uh, uncertainty estimation. So for example, you could implement different uh, reinforcement learning algorithms and look at the prediction for uh, any of the for each of them and then take the variance. So you can uh, use the same, uh, let's say, idea of getting those ensembles and extracting the uncertainty for them and using them to decide when to receive advice from a human, for example, or not. OK, great. Thank you. There, there is uh, time for one more question. I, I have one for myself also. Uh, the, the, do you think, uh, does, does the action advising uh, become more useful on continuous action space instead of discrete ones, given that on discrete uh, action space, you have fewer actions to, to choose from? Um, I... I would say that the, the advising is useful in all, all situations because even in the discrete state space, it's it's usually, if, especially if it's a, a, like a real world application, the agent has to explore a huge state space, even if it's uh, discrete. So we should take advantage of any knowledge that we have available to make the agent learn faster. But if it's continuous, it's also like, uh, 
it might take even longer for the agent to 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 learn so the advice is also very important and so it is like other kinds of uh, transfer learning that you could apply so i think in any real world application sometimes we do not do this when we are uh doing like research and uh evaluating in small environments but if you have a, a real world environment you should always like explore all types of transfer learning methods that you could apply in this situation to have the agent learning faster and make the, your application more scalable and applicable in more scenarios okay great thank you very much once again and thank you once again for your participation on the workshop thank you again for the invitation so uh, 